find here is not just that very narrow finding of the Supreme Court in, in the Bustamante case, but a very enlightening discussion that proceeds just a page or so prior to the ruling of the court, a discussion that involves custodial versus non-custodial situations. And the court in the Snekroth case, it seems to me, took some pains to labor over the distinction between custodial interrogation as it involves Miranda, as it might be distinguished from non-custodial situations where a person is asked for a consent to search and no advisement is given. And if the court will give me a moment, I'm sort of, it's a long opinion, I don't have my marked copy here, I just... I've got a, a larger copy. But in essence, I think what the Snack Law, what the, the Bustamante Court was saying was that we have inherent in the custodial situation, in the custodial circumstances, the potential for coercion. And that, of course, is the very reason why <coughs> the court in Miranda required the defendant be read his rights, his right to remain silent, his right to counsel, and so on, and that that is an absolute right, and that that right is that of every suspect in custody who is being interrogated. And the analogy, or the distinction, as it were, between Bustamante and the facts of this case is that it's clear that I was in custody, that I was not free to leave. I think the facts of this case show that I had, was being questioned and otherwise interrogated by police officers prior to a reading of any Miranda advisement. And what we see here is the beginning of a course of conduct, conduct on the part of officers at the scene in this search, whereby there was a systematic avoidance of taking into consideration not only the Fifth Amendment, but the Fourth Amendment. It's the testimony of Sergeant Hayward that he did not read me my Miranda rights prior to his initial search, that he did not advise me that I had a right to refuse consent to search my car if such a consent had been, if such a request to consent had been made. And I think that what, I know that what I'm asking the court now is to distinguish this case from the Bustamante case on the basis of custody versus non-custody, and then examine, as all the case law requires, examine all the circumstances surrounding the search, which have been brought forth through testimony heard by the court, to examine the totality of the circumstances. Have you read Watson since Bustamante? I recall seeing the case, but I don't, can't say that I've read it, Your Honor. All right, go ahead. That if, that based upon my analysis of the circumstances surrounding the alleged consent, there are these circumstances which I say weigh against finding that the consent was freely, voluntarily, and knowingly given, and which would detract from any attempt by the state to prove by whatever burden they have to prove it, that such a consent was legally obtained. The first would be, as it's been demonstrated, that there was no Miranda warning prior to the alleged request for the search or the actual search. Now, certainly, the law is clear that no such warning is required, but it is one of the factors that courts have looked to. It's one of the factors, one of the circumstances. 
The second would be the lack of advisement. That I had the right to refuse the consent to search. And I think that has been brought out in testimony this afternoon. The third factor which courts look to and have placed a considerable amount of paid a considerable amount of attention to is the attitude of the police and the circumstances which would indicate that the person, the defendant, the person in custody was subject to coercion or intimidation. There's some conflict in the record as to whether the police were hostile or not. It's my testimony versus the officer's testimony. And yet, I think if even if one takes and tries to take a middle line and just accepts the facts which are not in conflict, it is clear that I was stopped at an early hour of the morning, that I was alone, that I was surrounded by a number of police officers, I was told to go places and I went places, I was in custody, I was being, again, questioned in the absence of Miranda and questioned in such a fashion as indicated to me that the police were very upset about the circumstances of the stop. The fourth factor that I think is really important here is something the state will dwell on and something that I'm going to pay a great deal of attention to, and that's my failure to object, which I have admitted to and testified to. And indeed, I did not object to the search. And my explanation for my failure to object is and was, and my feelings are the same now as they were then, that when confronted with a number of police officers who I believe to be making demands of me and telling me what to do and where to go and questioning me in the way they were questioning me, and that alone at that hour of the morning, that I really had no control of the situation. And not knowing, and I did not know that I had a right to refuse any intrusion into my automobile, that I really felt I couldn't stop them from doing what they were doing. And that is in fact my testimony, and that is in fact, that's my testimony. The fifth factor is something that I, I want to make as clear as I can, because it deals with the manner in which the alleged request for a consent was made. The officer's testimony is that he had that flashlight, and he was looking, he said he looked in the car. He looked in that car, the flashlight, and then after seeing what he saw in there, came back to me and said, can I look in your car? Well, he had been looking in my car. And I don't want to split hairs, Your Honor, but if a trained police officer is going to request the search of vehicle with such ambiguous terms as look in your car, in the same way he describes as a visual looking in the car with a flashlight, to me it fails to meet the requirement of law that a request for a waiver of a constitutional right be expressed and be clear and be concise. There was no request for a consent search, let alone an advisement that I had the right to refuse any such request. The officer did not say, may I search your car, may I enter your car and search your car, or any words that were clear and concise and explicit. The best we have, if one believes the police officer, is that he said, can I look in your car? And the best he can come up with is that my response was, go ahead. And if you believe the police officer, he believed that to be a valid waiver of my Fourth Amendment right, if such a conversation took place. I believe that neither the request nor the reply was sufficiently explicit or expressive or intelligibly given to constitute a knowing waiver. So 
So it's my position that the search of the vehicle on August the 16th, 1975 did not occur pursuant to a valid consent. It's also my position that, that the state cannot rely on any plain view doctrine. In other words, the, it's the officer's testimony. He looked in the car and he couldn't put it all together, so he went back there. Obviously, what he saw in the car was not, in his own mind, sufficient to cause him to enter that car, believing he had probable cause. I don't think we have any probable cause argument left to the state here. And they've got to ride on, they've got to ride on consent or they don't go at all. <clears throat> you object to the search or the seizure? Well, here's, here is where we're going. Florida law is clear, and I think by the very nature of the term search and seizure, it is clear that we're talking about two terms that are not synonymous. The process of search and seizure, by its very definition, is a bifurcated process. And, it, and because, let's say, there's probable cause to search, or there is some exception to the warrant requirement that puts an officer in a position to be in a protected area, does not mean there's probable cause to seize. And this is what I was trying to get at when I was questioning Officer Andrack before. And that is, there must be probable cause to seize. Based upon the facts, the circumstances, and the information within the knowledge of that officer and what the court, of course, would believe that a prudent uh, person under those circumstances would do. It's the author. Even if, uh, of course, we're saying the consent did not occur, but even if, Detective Andrak was legitimately in the position to enter that car and to search it. My argument is that he did not have probable cause to seize for these reasons, which I, I didn't was able to bring out to a certain degree. That there were he knew nothing of any burglaries in the air. He did not know I, whether or not I had any criminal record. Uh, Possession per se was not a crime. Well, the possession of contraband or possession of burglary tools uh, infers that the officer had to believe that there was an intent to use those unless they had information in his own knowledge, facts with his own knowledge, that led him to have, gave him probable cause to believe there was an intent to use those or those articles had been used as burglary tools. Now, I'm not trying to stick, I, I can read to you the, the Florida, or the Utah statute on burglary tools, but of course we're not holding the officer to the knowledge of a legal technician. But we do impose upon Officer Andrak the knowledge of a prudent, a prudent and reasonable man. Uh, and and we, have to, we have to say, what did Officer Andrak know at the time he seized those things? He knew I'd been stopped, but he testified he didn't really know for what. I knew I was in custody, but not sure what I was in custody for. Didn't know anything about any burglaries in the area. That I, there was nothing that indicated to him I fit the description of a burglar. There was nothing to indicate to him that I had a history of burglary. <coughs> so I, I think the rule here is, are the articles seized from my car capable of lawful use as well as unlawful use. But beyond that, do they constitute in and of themselves burglary tools for which they could be seized? Was there probable cause to seize them? The officer's testimony is that under the rubric of the burglary tool statute, he seized a pair of handcuffs. Pardon me, burglary tool or handcuffs are per se tools which cannot be used in the course of a burglary. You use handcuffs and it seems to me that it becomes a robber by its very, by the very nature of Did Detective Pottinger ever ask you what significance you attached to photograph number seven during the course of this uh, photographic spread? I don't remember. Did 
Detective Pottinger do anything to either photograph four or seven to point out any similarity in the assailant? No, he did not. Question, did Captain Pottinger do that? Yeah. Oh. Did he do anything to allow you to ascertain a closer resemblance of either photograph four or seven? Could you repeat the question, yeah. please? Or expand on it. I'm not sure I understand. Well, did, did Captain Pottinger do anything in order to aid you in ascertaining whether there was a closer resemblance of either photograph seven or four? No. Did he take the photograph, either photograph, and place his hand on either photograph? Yes, he did. Which photograph? There were two photographs <coughs> at the time. I ruled out one, and there was only one left. I didn't compare them. Was there only one photograph that he placed his hand on? Yes. Did he ask you for an opinion as to the quality of your recognition? No. Did he give you a choice between whether you were definite or whether there was a striking resemblance? Yes. He photograph. Did. Pardon? Yes. Did he give you any other choices? No. You remember saying that you didn't know whether it was definite or there was a striking resemblance? Objection. I'm just going to have later questions. Only her recollection, and then you may answer the question. I don't remember. Right, now you may proceed. You remember Detective Pottinger saying, okay, do you feel definitely that this is the person or do you feel that there is a striking resemblance? Yes, I do. And your answer was, I don't know a pretty definite resemblance. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Now, what did you mean by, I don't know? I think she's going to have to answer it in terms of the entire well, answer. Well, I think she can answer it in the way that the question what did you mean by, I don't know? I don't know. I thought there was a very strong resemblance. No, you said a pretty definite resemblance. Well, yeah, if you want to say. I think the answer on the question was very definite resemblance. What did you mean by the portion of your answer that said, I don't know? She answered that, counsel. Did Detective Pottinger tell you who any of the other photographs were? No, he did not. Do you have an independent recollection of your familiarity with any of the features that appeared in the newspaper photographs compared to the features that appear in the photo number four in the photo lineup? Come a time that you returned to Tallahassee around July 27th for a grand jury. 
Yes. Tell me when you arrived. Um, I don't remember the exact time we came in. I think it might have been late morning. I'm not. No. Yeah. I'm. I'm not sure. I've come down here so many times. I'm not sure. And when was the grand jury here? The date? Well, relative to your arrival. Oh, um, I, I don't remember. I, I think it was, um, later on that day. Was it in the afternoon? Yes, I believe so. Did you meet with Mr. Simpson prior to going to the grand jury? Um, yes, I believe that was the first time I met Mr. Simpson. And where did you meet with him? In his office. And how long did you meet with him in his office? Um, I don't remember how long, maybe an hour. And did you discuss what you expected your testimony to be in the grand jury? Change the question. Please the question. Did you discuss with him the case? Yes, we discussed mainly the proceedings, what was going to go on in the, the grand jury. Um, he explained to me that there was no jurors, nothing nothing like that. Um, I had no idea what a grand jury was. Well, did you discuss with him uh, the events of the early morning of the 15th of January? Yes, I believe I did. Did you discuss with him your composite with uh, Mr. Keniston? I don't remember. Did you discuss with him the photographs you had seen in the newspaper? I don't remember. Did you discuss with him the photo lineup or photo spread that you had done with Detective Pottinger? Yes. And uh, give me the benefit of those discussions. Um, I explained to him what had happened, exactly how I just explained to you how it was done. And I told Mr. Simpson that I felt that the one picture I picked out, I felt very strong, I had very strong feelings that it was, um, that that was the man that I had seen that night. All right, did you go over that with the pictures with Mr. Simpson? No. Did you see the pictures in his office again? No. Did you see Nancy Dowdy? prior to going to the grand jury? Um, I don't remember her seeing her prior. Do you remember her coming to your motel room? Yes. What time was that? I, I don't remember. You don't remember that? No. Do you remember whether it was before you went to Mr. Simpson's office? I don't remember. Do you remember what you talked about with Nancy Dowd? Um, no, we got caught up on some sorority gossip. No, I'm talking about this case. No, I don't remember. Do you remember talking about the description with Nancy Dowd? No. Do you remember going over the description with her? Objection. Do you remember talking about what you had said to Nancy Dowdy as you came upstairs? Objection, Your Honor. When, when was this, Mr. Right. Simpson? In that? the motel room, Your Honor, do you remember discussing with Nancy Dowdy on the morning of, or whenever you met with her at your motel, discussing 
uh, what you had told to her as you came upstairs on the morning of the 15th of January. No, I don't remember. Did you walk over to the grand jury proceeding with Mr. Simpson? No. How did you arrive there? I, I believe um, Mr. Clark took us over. And what happened when you were called into the grand jury room? Objection. What are you talking about? Not a testimony, are you? Well, and so far as when you were called into the grand jury room, were you shown a photograph? Objection. I'll, I'll let her answer if she was shown a photograph. No. All right. Were you asked to state that you had made an identification Just for Mr. Simpson? Your Honor, we will move for the production on I've already ruled on the counsel. Proceed on. What uh, reference point did Mr. Simpson use for you to make an identification? The thing. You go in that grand jury court one more time. I'm marking this record, and when this case is over, we're gonna have another hearing. All right? Yes, sir. Well, we stand each other. Fine. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Did you have discussions with Mr. Clark or Mr. Simpson after the grand jury? No, I did not. Did there come a time that you later returned to Tallahassee? Yes. Between the time you left after the grand jury and the time you returned to Tallahassee, and that was in October, right? Right. Did you have any conversations with any detectives or any state attorneys? As it relates to the case, Your Honor, yes. No, I don't believe so. Recall what day it was you returned to Tallahassee in October? Um, as to the exact date, no. Do you recall when you first met with either an investigator or with Mr. Simpson? Yes, I do. When was that? Uh, it was the night before the um, trial was supposed to start. And where did you meet with him? In his office. And did you go over the case? Um, yes, I believe we went over um, my deposition. All right. Aside from your deposition, anything else? No. Did you Let me understand something now. Can, this young lady's deposition has been taken twice, is that correct? Yes. Then the deposition that you referred to is the one Mr. Minerva took prior to the October hearing? Not a deposition prior to October. Well, that's what I'm concerned with. I was not aware of one. If it was, I want to make sure it was made known to the defendant or to whoever it is, because court's only recollection uh, is sometime after that. Uh, inquire about that, counsel. The court's concerned with it. <clears throat> what papers did you look at? What papers? Yes, ma'am. What papers did Mr. Simpson show you? He didn't show me any papers. Well, there must have been a series of questions and answers. Is that right? Yes. Whose questions and answers did you look at? I didn't look at any. He asked me questions. He asked you questions and answers? Yes. Out of papers that he had before him? Yes. Would you try to recall as nearly as you can? what he asked you and what the answers were that he read to you? I will let her answer that in trial preparation. Post indictment, trial preparation. Go ahead, so the record's clear. Um, we went over my deposition, those were the, we just went over what I had stated before.
있고 What did you go over that you had stated before? Everything. <coughs> and we're limited to identification. Go over yeah. that, and I think we'll be right. closer to it. What did you go over that you had stated before in respect of Mr. Uh, Simpson? Uh, With respect to description. No, I let her go into that the identification issues. We went over. <coughs> uh, the same thing that has been said today and has been said. Well, can you give me some detail as to what you went over with Mr. Simpson? What did he tell you about the description? Objection, what did he tell her? Yes. Uh, I'll let her answer it, but... He didn't tell me anything about the description. He was asking questions. I was the one talking about the description. Well, what questions did he ask? Jack Donovan, it's repetitious. I, uh, is there any recordation of this document or anything? Any statements given? You're asking Mr. Simpson? No, I'm asking you. Are you aware of any? No, I'm not aware of any, Your Honor. As best you call, you may narrate it. Um, we went over the exact description as, as to the details of what the description I have of the man that night, um, the nose, the lips, the height, the build, everything we went over today. Well, when you say everything we went over today, please be specific. Okay? She wasn't in Tallahassee a week. She couldn't have gone over everything we've gone over. <laughs> Get as close as you can um, to remember, young lady. Did you the nose, the about. mouth, the build, the height, the coat, the pants, the ski cap, the position. Demonstration, did you do a demonstration for Mr. Simpson? I don't remember doing any demonstration, no. Did you go over the sketch that Mr. Keniston made with Mr. Simpson? Yes, I was showing the sketch. All right, what did you tell him about? Mr. Simpson showed you the sketch? Yes. All right, what was your discussions about the sketch? Um, the questions that I remember were asked were, were these, um, the sketches drawn, and which I answered yes, and to me, were they accurate? And I said yes. What do you mean, were they accurate? No, I don't know how she was just saying that. Did Simpson ask you if they were accurate? Objection, that's and what she said. Repetition. Did you... Did he attempt to distinguish the uh, sketches Jackson. one from another? Jackson. I'll let her in. Did he ask you to compare the sketches to the assailant? He asked me if they were a fair drawing. Did he ask you if the sketches resembled Mr. Bundy? Objection. Sustained. If you want to Did find out if you ask any other question about the sketches, I'll let you know. What else did you discuss with Mr. Simpson about the sketches? That's about it. Try to search your memory. Objection. Let me know if that's about it or if that is it. Objection. I'll let him. If you have any other recollection, young lady? No, I do not. All right. Did you discuss the uh, newspaper photographs with Mr. Simpson? Objection. She's already testified that. I think she did, Ken. Did he show you <coughs> any newspaper articles? No, he did not. Did he show you the photographs that you would be expected to select at a trial? No, he did not. Who else was present 
besides Mr. Simpson and yourself? No one. And how long did this preparation for trial take? Objection. So a period of time were they there? Yes, Your Honor. She was there. What period of time were you there with Mr. Simpson? I believe I answered that before I approximated an hour. I don't think I heard that deposition. I thought I answered that before an hour. You might have. I missed it about an hour. Yes, Thank approximately. You. Thank you. <clears throat> Did you render any opinion to Mr. Simpson? I told you I felt strong about the photograph. Is that what you told Mr. Simpson? Yes. Did you tell him anything else along those lines? Not that I remember. Did Mr. Simpson ask you about the other photograph that you had taken out? No, he did not. The next morning, did you meet Mr. Simpson or someone from Mr. Simpson's office at the courthouse? No. How did you arrive at the courthouse? Um, we drove to the courthouse with Mr. Clark. Who's Mr. Clark? Uh, an officer. With whom? With whose office? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe, um... Sheriff's Department. I'm not sure which department. Was he uniformed or ununiformed? Um, he was ununiformed at the time. And Mr. Clark took you where? From your hotel to the court? Yes. Did you discuss uh, the case with Mr. Clark? Sustained. Did you discuss anything relating to the assailant with Mr. Clark? Not that I remember. And tell me what happened when you arrived at the courthouse with Mr. Clark. Um, we waited and then um, my mother and I were seated in the courtroom and we waited for it to begin. All right, at what time did you arrive? In the courtroom. <clears throat> Where were you seated in the courtroom? I believe facing the judge, the second bench back um, on the right hand side. And did you arrive before or after proceedings had begun? Before. Before? Were there any other prospective witnesses there also? Yes, there was. Who was there that you knew? Jackson. On identification concept, I'm going to sustain it. Who did you speak with? Jackson. Same, same room. What happened when court began? Objection. We're a little bit old guard, Mr. Haggard. The issue, of course, is identification. And anything about that you may go into, but. Did anyone come into the courtroom aside from the judge and the bailiff and court personnel after the court began? Objection. Well, I'll let her answer that. But you, you can be a little more direct than that, Mr. Haggard. I'm sure Mr. Wetherington and quite a few people up there in this court has met were in and out of that courtroom. The question is, did the defendant come in young lady? Yes. And where did he come into the courtroom from? I don't remember exactly. What was he wearing? Um, he was wearing a light blue jacket, I believe, and I don't know what pants. From 
And where did you see him in the courtroom when he entered? God, the invitation for an enemy. I let him out the door. I saw him here from behind. Was he standing or seated? Um, both. How long did you have to observe him? Um, I don't remember how long I was in there, but I did not stare at him the whole time. Well, give us your best estimate of how long you were there when he was there. Probably half an hour. And during this half hour, what was happening in court? They were trying to get the um, case delayed because of certain motions. What's commonly called a motion for continuance? Objection. And who was arguing the motion for continuance or delay? Mr. Bundy. And where was he standing relative to your seat when he was arguing the motion? He was in front of me, a little to my left. A little to your left? Could you maybe, uh, let's assume you were seated uh, back here in the second row, uh, perhaps where that lady in the blue shirt is seated. Where would Mr. Bundy have been? I'm sorry, I don't know what lady you're talking about. Um, this pretty lady here in the blue shirt. They're all pretty, Mr. Bundy. <laughs> I've learned that, Judge. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Relative to her, where was Mr. I'm sorry, I still don't know which one you mean. Which one you mean? Hold up your hand here. You. you. Hold up your hand. This lady, did you see her? Yes. Uh, where would Mr. Bundy have been? Um, I'm just a little bit further. Tell, yeah. tell me where to go. I know you probably like probably it. To the seat next to him. About here? Would this be a fair approximation? Yes. Difficult to reproduce this for the record, John. Uh, indicating about uh, 12 feet and uh, maybe an angle of 20 degrees. Looks like it's a little farther than that. I'll go 15. I'd take 20. <laughs> 17 and a half feet. <laughs> it's somewhere between 15 and 20. Let the record reflect it. And how long you say he was doing this motion for about a half hour? Approximately. And did you have an opportunity to to observe his facial features? Yes, I did. Did you recognize him in the courtroom? In what regard? Uh, I modify your question. You may proceed with it. Well, question. did you recognize him as the assailant? Um, I didn't get the exact profile that I had gotten that night, I recognized him to look like the man I saw in the picture, but again, it was not that exact profile as I had seen in the picture. To look like the man you had seen in the picture? Yes. Wait a minute, that's not what you said. Watson, we don't want to buy in this courtroom in an undershirt. If he can go get a shirt, he can come back.
Yeah. Did you ever say, uh, or did you ever, you said here just a moment ago that you did not see the profile? I understood you to say, is that correct? Jackson is not what In court? We stay consistent with the answer when we make the sheets. Could I have the answer read back? Yes, you may. Yeah, I can appreciate that. I think that's a valid procedure. Answer, I didn't get the exact profile that I had gotten that night. I'd have recognized to look like the man I saw in the picture, but again, it was not that exact profile as I had seen in the picture. Previously, remember uh, stating to Mr. Minerva that the profile looked the same, but then I saw him face on and I couldn't recognize him. Objection. We asked her if she ever made that statement, and then you made. question was by Mr. Minerva, Mr. Bundy looks thinner than the person that you saw? Answer, yes. As I saw him in the courtroom, he looked awfully thin, but his height looked the same. The profile looked the same, and uh, but then if I saw him face on, I couldn't recognize him. Do you recall that question and answer? Yes, I do. Is that a correct, uh, is your answer there correct? Yes. So it would be fair to say from that that you couldn't recognize him in the courtroom? I, I think that's fine. Just fine. Would it be fair to say, Ms. Neary, that during the progress of this case, you've gained more confidence Objection. in your identification? Objection. I, I think confidence might be a bad word. To restate the question, I'll let you ask it. Well, you have gained a uh, greater degree of emotional certitude. Objection. You leave emotional and ask certainty, you may ask the question. <laughs> emotional certainty? No, I think I said leave emotional. You've got a great deal more certainty of his identification. I'll let you ask the question. Yes. Would you say that that has been a gradual process? Yes. Has your original observation of the assailant been improved in any way by any of the uh, procedures that you've been subjected to? Objection. Limited to hypnosis, I'll let you ask the question. Has your ability or your observation of the assailant on the morning of January 15th been improved by hypnosis? 
I'll let her answer. Has it been approved by the hypnosis? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. No. When you were under hypnosis with Mr. Arroyo, can you describe your visual representation Jackson. that you've had? Jackson, I think she's going in for the room. Been testified to previously. I was going to develop a different point. Right? I understand that, but she's already testified to it. You said it's an already established projection point. See that? Was the image that you held for Mr. Arroyo, would you, how would you describe it? Is it clear or fuzzy? Or anything in between? Um. <clears throat> it's hard to me, for me to answer that. The, the details were clear. Not much, not any clearer than I before. 